Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that song. Thank you. Thank you for just loving God. Lord, I, I thank you for allowing me to just have one more day, just one more day for answering my prayers, for taking care of me, for keeping your arms around me. You know, it's just some folks just don't understand how good God is. Some Amen. folks just don't understand that just reaching out at the right time yeah. can just take care of so many things. And, and in today's message, you know, it, it touched me personally. And uh, Satan is just always, always, always trying to deter us, trying to stop us, trying to tell us that something's not real, trying to break us down and I'm just so glad that there's a God out there that loves me. I'm just so glad that God has compassion and mercy and patience, most of all patience, because ooh we, ooh we. See, some folks, they want to deny where they came from. They want to deny where they've been. They don't want to look in the mirror and, and it faced the man that's in the mirror and understand that God gave his son so all of us could have salvation. Amen. Ebenezer, I'm just elated and honored to be here one more Sunday to, to be able to come before you to present a message. And, and you know, we, we try to do our best and Satan's always lurking, looking to try and make us go down the wrong path. I'm just glad I, as I listened to the Sunday school lesson, and, and I thank you for Sister Marilyn being able to teach Sunday school for us here. And, you know, you may not know, but I, I listen when I'm in there and I, I pick up little snippets and stuff and it just helps me Amen. because we're always in a constant state of learning or we should always be in a constant state of learning. You know, and, and one of the things I've learned over time is that you know, at one point when I felt that I was never be worthy to be able to speak about God in front of folks because I didn't know the Bible like some folks, you know, some folks can just, oh, they can just, I was, as I was sitting there just now thinking some folks can just recite scripture after scripture and you can just call one out and they just know it. And I, and I, I said, what a blessing. But you know, they say that Satan knows the Bible also. And then I had to realize that because I can't remember every scripture in the Bible, that that don't mean that God can't use me. Amen. So Amen. he gives me what I need when I need it. Yeah. And that's that's the thing that's so important to, to know that when you need something, God provides it. And when God calls you, you can't step back and say, I, I don't know. You know, I, I look at the case of Moses who stuttered and couldn't talk right and he says, well, I, I can't go before the people and I can't speak to the people. And God says, I, I have a spokesman for you. I, I still need you in this position. And it's just like with us, you know, we have to understand that when he sends us somewhere, he's already prepared a way for us. Amen. So what we have to do Amen. is obey and be obedient and go and serve and do Amen. what he's asked us to do. He's going to take care of the rest. Amen. He's going to give us the words to say. You know, there's times I struggle with trying to write and then all of a sudden God just drops it on me and I says, oh, okay, <laughs> there you go. But you see, we get blinded by these distractions in our life. So many things that come our way to try to take our mind off of what we're supposed to be doing. And that's nothing but Satan because Satan never, never, never rests. And we'll talk about that today. Our, our message today, just six short uh, uh, verses out of the book of Job. 
And uh, several weeks ago, I was talking with my oldest sister who's studying and she's talking about her professor and they were talking about Job and she called me and she says, well, what's the deal with Job? And I says, well, you have to understand that because a lot of people are so based on money and thinking that money is everything that they get so wrapped up that when they don't have it, when it's taken away, when it's snatched from them, they get pretty upset, not realizing that what they had didn't come from so much as their hard labor. Hard labor has a lot to do with it, but it comes from the blessings of God. Yes, and, and folks don't understand it, but then we have to also understand that Satan rewards his imps also. So if a lot of folks get a little bit twisted, but when you're out there in the world and you're doing everything and Satan promises you everything, there's a price to pay. You have your rewards here, but there's a price to pay. But God also rewards us and, and, he, and he blesses us. And it's not luck. You know, so many people talk about luck, but I, I told him, I was talking to my sister, I says, well, you see, when Job had everything taken away from him, when he was downtrodden, when he was being dumped on, he never cursed the Lord. And that's what folks sometimes don't understand. So, yeah. Sister Marilyn, if you'd read for us, this Job, the second chapter, verses 1 through 6. I'll try to keep my message to a minimal, but that doesn't always work. <laughs> so I'll just let God lead me as I present the message. Job 2, verses 1 through 6. It'll be out of the NIV. And i wait for the scripture to be read now. On another day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came with them to present himself before him. And the Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil, and he still maintains his integrity. Though you entice me against him, to ruin him without any reason. Skin for skin, Satan replied. A man will give all he has for his own life. But now stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well, then he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. Mm. May the Lord have a blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Lord has blessed his word. And as he says, you can do anything you want. You can touch him any way you want, but spare his life. Spare not kill him. Amen. Spare his life. Good morning, Ebenezer. Morning. Have you ever had someone in your life try to destroy everything? that you have accomplished. You know, it may seem that their only purpose in life is to destroy you. Amen. Bring you yes. down yes. and discourage you. Amen. Typically, I say typically, you don't want to think of somebody who you know as being your adversary. And for, for the most part, most of them aren't. Most of the people you know aren't against you, but it's those hidden snakes. Oh, yes. Yes. Amen. I'm going to say it again. It's those hidden snakes. Yes. Those people who sit back who envy you. Those people who sit back who don't know the Lord and don't understand and why you're being blessed in certain ways that want to destroy you. Amen. You see, envy sometimes raises its ugly head in our lives. Amen. And folks don't like to see you prosper. They don't like to see you happy. They don't like to see you doing well. Sometimes they don't even want to see you healthy. Amen. They're hidden snakes. Those are the ones we have to worry about. Amen, amen. The ones sitting in the dark, yes, just waiting to devour us. 
and destroy us. We typically, typically, don't even see them coming, do we? Amen. Because you see, we are so busy looking at everything else that we miss the signs that we are in danger. The danger that's right in our faces. We get distracted by whatever is in our views that we miss the hidden dangers. Mm -hmm. Oh, church, somebody has been distracted by the distractions. Now, our message today is not about distractions. That's a message for another day, church. Our message today is about being touched. Somebody say being touched. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to our text. Our text today tells us about this conversation that Satan was having with God. And it seems that this conversation was a continuation from what he had with God earlier. And you see, it was about a deal. It was about an agreement. It was about an understanding that Satan would be allowed to touch Job in every way. But to touch him in every way, which Satan did, but not, I understand, and I say this again, but not to kill him. He says, you can do what you want to with him, but don't kill him. Now, if you read the chapter, and I'm quite sure you have, in chapter number one, it tells about Job and all of his riches, all the things that, his had, that he had, his sons, his daughters, his home, his wife, his friends, his, his relationship with the community, and his relationship with God. Now, don't forget that part, the relationship with God, because that's the most important part. You, you see, so when you have a relationship with God, things that come to you, when you lose them, you don't worry about them. And you see, in Job, as he was beginning to lose things, and the messengers was coming to him one by one, your children have died, and your oxen are gone, and your camels are gone, and everything is burned up, and this is happening, and that's happening. And Job, whoa, Job. And Job's reply was, the Lord gave it to me. It's yeah. the Lord's to take away. Now, understand, there's a lot of folks that don't think like yeah. that. We know quite a bit of them. Anybody out here ever had a job that worked for private industry? Private, somebody that owned the company. And you see, when they're up here, they're doing well. All is right with the world. And they might give you a few dribblings that come down from their profits. And all they can think about is the money that they're going to make and the money that they made. Amen. You, you know, I look back at my past jobs and I look at some of the children that they had and how they frivolously spend their money and how they just think money grows on trees. And even the owners of the place who sometimes thought that just money grew on trees because they had so much of it. And I says, well, what happens? If the bunny dries up, All right. you see, will you still have your joy and your happiness? Will you still be able to rejoice and have a good time? You see, because they don't understand that it was God that gave it to them. Mm -hmm. They don't understand that God has been blessing them and watching over them, but they're too foolish in their ways. Mm -hmm. You know, years ago, I worked when I was an exterminator. And I remember I used to go, I had a section of on my route that was for the very wealthy, it was very wealthy, right on the lake of Lake Erie, a, a, a little city called Bradnall. So if anyone ever been to Cleveland, Ohio, there's a t little town called Bradnall. And it's where the elite of the elite, they call it old money. You know, you know what old money is, right? So it's where the old money was. And I had a customer, Mrs. Dudovesky. I'll never forget this woman. And every month that I went there, she was always miserable and sad. And her housekeeper would sit there and snicker and say, that's the most miserable woman I've ever met. And she'd always ask me, she says, why are you always so happy? And I says, I'm just happy because I'm alive. But you see, I didn't understand that I had God who was watching over me at the time. But I knew there was something special that was happening for me. And I says, I'm just happy. She said, well, you don't have a lot. You're just an exterminator. 
And I said, this is true. I don't have a lot, but what I have, I'm able to enjoy. Amen. She says, well, I have houses and I have horses and I have boats and I have yachts and I have money and I have this and that and I'm very miserable. And her main problem was she was afraid that she would lose her money at some point. And I said, well, ma'am, you have to stop worrying about that. I said, you hoard things, things that you'll never be able to use. You have things, things that are stored up that you'll never be able to use. And you're so afraid to get rid of something that you are miserable in this house. Your husband is miserable and you have everything that any person would love to have, but you're miserable. And she said, but I don't understand how you could be happy and poor. I said, I'm happy because I'm alive. I'm happy because I'm not worried about losing something. You see, when you're worried like that, you can't focus on the things that you have. I says, well, maybe why don't you try this since the Christmas season is coming up? I says, have you ever given your housekeeper a gift for Christmas? She goes, well, I give her $50. I says, oh, you give her $50, wow. I says, you got an attic full of all kinds of baby clothes and toys and all kinds of things up there. With some of most of them with the tags still on them that the kids have never worn. She goes, yes, but one day my kids may have, I says, do you think your kids are going to want to give that stuff to their kids that's going to be 30 years old when they start having kids? I says, why don't you take that down to the shelter? Why don't you start giving the police gifts? Why don't you start giving away some of your money and stop worrying about losing your money? Maybe you'll be happier. Why don't you talk to God? Now, you see, once again, don't get me wrong. I, I just mentioned it to her because God put it in my spirit. But see, I wasn't talking to God. So I, I want you all to understand something now. See, because when God's taking you someplace, when he's allowing you to experience some things, when he's bringing you through it, you see, it's for a purpose. And even though I didn't know that one day I would be here, he was preparing me. And he put those words out. Yes, sir. Talk to God. Stop worrying. Give away some things. I says, besides, some of the stuff you can write off on your taxes if you're that worried, but you don't have to worry about a thing. And I remember she looked at me with the, you know, the deer in the head, like, look. Yeah. <laughs> has this little black boy lost his mind? <laughs> You want me to give away that stuff in the attic that I'll never use and until a house burns down, it'll stay there? You want me to give somebody some money? You want me to, what? And I'll never forget, this was in November. When I went back in December, she had this big smile. You know the smile that the, the, the people in the world like to use. You know that smile? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that he, she had that smile. She had that smile on her face. Amen. Amen. And she says, I want to thank you. And I says, well, what do you want to thank me for? She says, you know, I've been worried about so much so often, so long. I took up your advice. She says, I laid there and I tossed and I turned. And I don't know God, but I tried to talk to God and I gave away a lot of stuff. She goes, you're going to be surprised when you go in that attic. She goes, I went down to the police department and I gave everybody down there several hundred dollars. She says, I gave my housekeeper a big Christmas bonus. She goes, and I have a pile of stuff in the other room that I went out and bought for you and your family. And I took so much to the shelter. She goes, and I feel so good about it. I says, but you can't just stop today. Continue to do that. You see, folks get so wrapped up and worried about what they have that they can't enjoy what they have. Now, I don't know if later on she might have had a relationship with the Lord, but I know one thing. She was happy that year. Amen. You see, getting back to our lesson, it's about the agreement that God had with Satan. And when, when Satan took all that Job had, and folks expected Job to curse God, mm -hmm. because you see so many people get wrapped up in their things. So many get, people get wrapped up in possessions. They, they don't understand about the money. And all Job said was, the Lord gave it, and guess what? He can take it away. You see, Satan is always lurking 
and looking to see who he can devour, to see who he can destroy, to see who he can kill. You see, he wants your soul and he never rests. Amen. Amen. He's just looking, just lurking, waiting for the right moment to pounce on you yes, sir. and capture you. You see, he is always on the prowl. Amen. You see, church, some of us think that it's okay to take a little rest at times. Sometimes we think we can let our guards down. Sometimes we think we don't have to worry. And we get very comfortable with ourselves. We start to think that nothing can happen to us. But those are the times that Satan is sitting there waiting to pounce, waiting to shoot something by you to remind you of your old ways to tempt you, to bribe you, to get you into a position that you don't want to be in. Yes, sir. We think that the coast is clear, but you see, Satan is never resting. Amen. In our text, it reads that God asked Satan, where have you been? And he said, oh, <laughs> I've been here and there. I've been roaming, going to and fro, searching for my next victim. He's not going to give up. He's always searching for his next victim. Now, church, if you aren't coming from somewhere, guess what? Then you are going somewhere. Amen? Amen. And we've all come from somewhere. Some of the places haven't been so good. Amen? Amen? Some of them have been places that we don't want to brag about. Some of them have made us hold our head down in shame. I can testify there's too many places that I've been that I had to hold my head down. But God said, lift your head up, son, because I gave my only begotten son to live, bleed, and die so that you can hold your head up in pride. You don't have to look back anymore. You can look forward because you've been there. I want to know where you're going. And if you're going where I want you to go, you can hold your head up high because now you have a story to tell for the folks who's back there doing what you used to do so that you can help them come along. You see, by experience, we can be able to lift someone up. Amen? Amen. Most folks think that if you had a sordid past, that that's going to always hold you down. But you see, it's that sordid past that will be able to lift someone else up. It's that past that you can testify and say, this is when I was down. This is when I was lost. This is when I was out there in the world. But you see, God gave this son so that I can hold my head up, so that I can speak to you and let you know that what he gave me is just not for me, but it's for you and everybody else that wants it. Amen? Amen. I want to say that it's not where you came from at this point in our lives. It's important. It's where we're going. We've all come from some place. But where are we going? That's the question. Where are we going? I know some of us are puzzled by what our future might look like because of what our past have been. I, I was one of them. I was one of them that just said, I know God can't use me. As I was speaking to my teacher on Thursday night, we were talking. I was explaining to her how I was out there lost. And, and when the prophet was talking to me, telling me that God is calling me, and I'm telling the prophet, he must mean my brother Randolph. You see, Randolph, Rudolph, they're real close. And he says, God don't make mistakes. Amen. Your, 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 your brother has his own story to tell, but you see, you see, you're going through something right now. You, you're doing some things right now. You're, you're in a quagmire. You, you're the one that he wants because, you see, it's that experience that you have that's going to be able to elevate and lift someone up so that someone will they'll lend their ear to you so that they can understand that, you see, you've been through it. And I says, but are you sure? He says, God, don't make mistakes. He sent me to you because you're the one one that's going to be on your back calling his name. Yeah. You're the one that's going to be stuck in the mud, in the miry clay, wanting to get up, but he's going to set your foot up on a solid rock and give you a foundation. He's going to give you a new song. That song you're singing about, Shake It to Tail Feather, you ain't going to be singing that song anymore. You're going to be singing that song, Somebody Prayed for Me. 
You see, he don't make them kind of mistakes. Church, I'm here to tell you that when you're walking with the Lord, when you're trusting in God's salvation, when you know the grace of God and mercy is your protected and you don't have to worry about what the future holds because it's been predestined. You see, our futures have been predestined. As I was speaking with the lady in Bretton, my future was predestined. As I was speeding, going down the highway, spinning out and not dying, and I suddenly was facing traffic, my future was predestined. When I went to prison and I was learning things and had to learn to change my heart and change my mind, it was predestined because someone touched me. That someone was God. He reached yeah. out and touched me and he said, son, I'm saving you. Through all the foolishness that you've done, I'm yeah. saving you. Through all the times that you've kicked the wall, I'm saving you. Yeah. For all the times that you didn't know I was there when I had to carry you and you looked down and saw one set of footprints, I'm saving you. Yeah. Thank you. Amen. So many times churches travelers on this lonesome road we have been touched by many things. Oh, we've been touched mentally. We've been touched physically. We've been touched emotionally. We've been touched financially. But the Bible tells us that he's roaming this earth looking and lurking, looking for who he can devour, looking for who he can destroy, looking for who he can kill. We are constantly being chased in order so that he can touch us. Yeah and ruin us, and bring us down and kill us, because we've let our guards down. But I like the fact, I love the fact that there's a God above who's looking down also, who knows that he's chasing us, who says, let me put my wings, my arms of protection around you, because I know that Satan is out there waiting, and you trust me, and you love me, and you believe in me, so I've got to protect you. Yes. Oh, it's good to know that. Yes. Satan wants to touch us in any way that he can, church, and he doesn't take a day off to rest. He doesn't take a day off to play. He doesn't take a day off to relax because he wants your soul. He wants to catch you at your downtime just to snatch your attention away from what your goal should be. And you see he's lurking and looking to send you to a place that you don't want to go. Amen. He never, ever, never gives up. You see, this morning, he tried to attack me. I, I talk about that. So, so let me give you, this is my experience. I had, so yesterday, I, I called my wife. I says, we're going to dinner tonight. She likes Eden Park. I hate Eden Park. That's her favorite place, my least favorite. She says, okay. She gets home and we go, she says, I don't want to go to Eden Park. I want to go somewhere else. Last time I went to Eden Park, it wasn't a good, it wasn't a good experience. My mind was setting for Eden Park because I'm thinking I'll just have bacon and eggs and, and, uh, and, and uh, toast and hash browns. It's hard to mess that up. Amen. I says, I'll just have me breakfast for dinner. Anybody ever have breakfast for dinner? You know, yeah, that's pretty good. And she says, no, 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 no. Let's go to Olive Garden. Now, I typically like Olive Garden. It's one of my favorite places. So we go to Olive Garden. Service was good. Food was okay. And I tried something I hadn't tried before. That chili bean soup stuff. I forgot what they call it. They ought to call it uh, hot guts in the morning. <laughs> so I ate my soup and my entree. Went home, I was okay. Woke up this morning. Didn't feel anything till I walked into the bathroom. And I noticed that my stomach, now I know I got a little bit of a stomach, okay? I ain't in the best of shape. I'm gonna get there though. But I noticed that my stomach was very extended and very hard. And I had this uncertain pain. I'm, I, I can't describe it because I never had this kind of pain before. I don't want to equate it to labor pains, but I had this very bad pain that had me doubled over. And, and see, as, as a man, and unfortunately this is how we are, I wanted to try to figure it out myself. I didn't want to just awake my wife and says, hey, 
I'm having this pain. Because I do know that if it got worse than it was getting, I was going to the hospital. But I started praying. I says, God, it's too short a nerve notice for me to call Deacon Rice and say I can't make it to church. Because I'll tell you, on my dying breath, if it's everything I have that's in me, I'm coming to church. Amen? Amen. Unless it's dire consequences. But you see, I talk about the power of prayer. Amen. I talk about arrow prayers. I talk about faith. I talk about trust. I talk, talk about belief. And as the pain was increasing and the pain had me doubled over as I was taking a shower, and I just kept praying. I said, God, I need you to take this away from me. And then to double it off, my, my shoulders started getting. <laughs> I said, oh, I say, say, you can't have me this morning. I, I got to talk about some things. And Satan just whispered. He says, you, you want to talk about being touched. I'm touching you right now. See how you like me now. And my stomach was hurting and it was hurting and I'm thinking the Sundays are the Sunday. Typically I don't cook a big breakfast every day, but Sundays are my big breakfast day. And I says, boy, I, I want to eat, but I don't want to eat because my stomach's bothering me. I says, well, God, can you just take this pain? And if it's gas, I don't know what it is. I said, but if it's gas, just blow it out of me before I got to go. I said, if there's something else that needs to come out, get it out of me before I have to go. But God, I, I, I need you because I need to go and present your message. You, you, you see, I'm faithful, I'm dedicated, but I trust that you can take care of this for me. Yes. And I gave it to him. And I remember when I went into the kitchen, I said, okay, God, I'm, I'm asking you for the last time. And God says, I heard you. So I fixed my, my breakfast and I sat down and I'm glad nobody was in the kitchen with me. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> but as time went on, my pains went away. And by the time I was done, I was feeling 100%. But I kept saying, devil, you can't have me. Devil, you can't have me. Devil, you a liar. You see, folks don't understand the power of prayer. Folks don't understand that when you trust and you believe, that Satan is always out there lurking, trying to stop us, trying to distract us, trying to persuade us not to do what our God-given calling is to be. Yes. Satan is saying, no, call off, go to the hospital, lay there, have a pity party. You don't want to go out to Blydale today. You want to sit here and hold your stomach. And I says, I don't care if my stomach's hurting. If it don't stop hurting and there's no blood and there's no diverse reactions that's going, I'll preach with a belly ache and whatever. The guy says, I have something for you. You know, Sister Marilyn talked about that a couple weeks ago. Remember you talked about when you had to shoot up your arrow prayer and God can't? You see, folks don't understand us Christians when we had them arrow prayers. Sometimes we need a right now blessing. Sometimes we need it. I can't wait to later on. I need this right now, God. And God is up there listening because Satan is lurking. He's saying, I'm going to distract you. Let me give you a little pain. Let me, okay, that stomach pain, and let, let me throw something in your shoulder. Shoulder's all right now. Stomach's all right now. But I'm, I'm glad nobody was in that kitchen. That's all I'm going to say about that. Satan never gives up. Never gives up on us. Satan chose Job because he thought that a rich man would surely have no soul. And if you look at a lot of the rich people out there today, you would think that they don't have a soul because they, some of them would actually sell their souls to the devil. I've heard some of the stars have sold their souls to the devil. I was listening to a program not too long ago about all of these popular stars who make this music. And in their music, they say, I've sold my soul to the devil. And they've publicly confessed that they've sold their souls to the devil and the Illuminati for fame. And I says, oh, you have your fame now, but what? Fire lurks waiting on you. You see, even Jesus said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to give up his riches. Amen? Amen. The devil thought that Job would cave when he was experiencing merciless pain and turmoil. He says, okay, I've taken away everything that you have. I've killed your children. 
I've saved your wife so she can complain and tell you to curse God. I've left your friends so that they can tell you to curse God. I've taken all your riches, and now I'm going to give you boils and merciless pain. I'm going to give you things that you haven't experienced. I'll make you cave. I'll make you curse God. But you know what? Job sat in the ashes and says, I'll never curse God. <laughs> Why should I curse God? He gave me life. Amen? You see, we have to understand that even going through some things, even as I was going through the pain this morning, I was still blessing God. I was still saying, thank you. I, I may not enjoy this pain, but I know that I have pain. And I thank you because I can recognize that I am hurting, that I need something. You see, a lot of people can't even feel their pain. A lot of people can't even feel their joints or their, their digits. They, they can't feel their feet. They can't feel, they can't taste. Some can't see, some can't hear. But God has allowed me to still have all my senses. And I'm thankful. Amen. He thought that Job would forget about where his blessings came from. You see, we can never forget about who blessed us and why he blessed us. And if God gave it to us, it's his God's to take it away. Because guess what? He can replenish it. When I had everything stripped from me when I went to prison, and I mean everything, my house, all the belongings. I remember calling home and, and neighbor says, they're going through your house like it's a Macy's. People are going down the street in your clothes. They're walking down the street with your stove and refrigerator. They've just taken everything out of your house. But there was nothing I can do. And I says, well, I ain't going to worry about it. God blessed me once. And if he wants me to have something else, he'll bless me again. Why should I worry? Because at this point, I was trusting God. At this point, I had found that relationship. It was at this point that when I was laying in the miry clay that I looked up and I reached out and I called to God that he answered me. He says, I'm here for you, but you have to trust me. Not just today. We're not, gonna, we're not making a today deal. We're making a lifetime deal. You see, so many people want to make a quick deal and think that God's going to just get them out of it. And then they can't understand when they're still in that mess, why they stay in that mess. But I says, God, I have learned. I, I, I'm sorry that I ran against you. I'm sorry I didn't listen to you. I heard the prophet. So whatever you need from me, I'm going to trust you. He says, are you going to trust me? I said, I'm going to trust you. Are you going to trust me? I'm going to trust you. And when I ended up in jail, I remember the first thing I did, I says, thank you, Lord. I trust you because I know you have a plan for me. I know that this is not permanent, that this is a temporary stop. I know that you have taken me, are taking me someplace that you can prepare me, that you can mold me like this lump of clay that I am because I've come, the, the mold that I was already in was messed up. So you had to break it down, throw water on it and make me into clay again so you can reform me. I said, thank you. I sat there and folks said, well, why are you thanking God? You're in jail. I said, <laughs> And I'm going to prison and I'm still thinking, because you see, he loved me so much that he saved me from myself. He saved me from those thoughts that was going through my head that says I was worthless, that I don't deserve to be on this earth, that I need to just die. You see, because that's how Satan jumps on you. He tried to jump on Job the same way. He says, hey, let me give you this pain and you just want to die. But Job says, I oh, know, I ain't cursing God. I'm going to hold out. You see, a lot of folks don't want to hold out. They want just a quick remedy. And sometimes you got to go for the long run. Sometimes you got to endure the pain. Sometimes you got to look up and you have to say, God, take me where you want me to go. Teach me what you want to teach me. And just let me learn and then use me. So as God was using me, as God was forming me, as God was getting me ready and blessing me, I said, thank you. But you see so many people. They want to just curse God. They can't endure the pain. They can't take losing what they had. They get so used to living up here that they don't know how to live down here anymore. Amen. He thought Job would give up and die. But oh, I say, oh, little did he know that Job was God's people. He didn't know that. That was God's property. Little did he know that God's faithful people would never give up on God. He thought that this morning that I would just roll over and say, I'm not going. But you see, even when I got burned up before I came here, and a lot of y'all folks don't know about that, that Sunday I got burned. I got burnt pretty bad. I mean, I got really burnt pretty bad. It was by the grace of God that I'm standing here able to talk to you today. Because I should be dead. I should be in the ground, nothing but bones remaining at this point. Amen. But God saved me. Yeah. 
I had a boiler blow up on me. Well, I wouldn't say blow up. The You know the overflow valves on the boilers, I have radiator heat. Anybody know about those? And, and so they have a pressure release valve. And on my furnace, my particular furnace that, I was, that burnt me up that day, uh, it, instead of them having a, you know, most furnaces and even hot water tanks have the little elbow that, that shoots the water to the ground in case it overflows or, or it, it uh, erupts. You, you guys know what I'm talking about? And, and you see, this particular Sunday, it was after church, I had left Mount Olive and I was home and it was the first cold day of, of the season. I think it was a September 26th or something like that. It was the first cold day. And I remember I kicked on the furnace and my furnace head, y'all know them sometimes the furnace make that noise and you have to add water. Anybody know about maintaining the furnace? You, you know, with those mm -hmm. boilers. So thank God, you see, God always prepares a way. God always makes a way. He, he, he sets things up for you. So I didn't have a screw on type of a valve. I had that little flip up with water in and back down. And so I opened it up, let it back down. It was still knocking. I opened it back up and I noticed and sometimes it ain't good to be nosy. Sometimes it ain't good to be inquisitive. But I noticed that the furnace had the overflow valve, and the furnace was about this high off of the ground. And, and, and I can remember looking at the, at, the, at the furnace and the valve, and I'm thinking to myself, well, I wonder what's in there. And, and see, by me not being able to see real well, you, you notice a lot of times, you I notice I look over my glasses a lot when I'm reading. It's because I'm whatever, far-sighted, short-sighted, whatever, I'm, I'm blind. And so I says, well, let me look down in there. And I remember getting on my knees and looking at my eyes and put my glasses down like this, looking in the hole. And I, I had left the valve up, mm. filling up the water. And the furnace was on, and it was gurgling and bubbling and doing what the furnace is supposed to do. And I remember, I remember the stinking guy says, get up and get your phone. And I didn't understand why, but I said, okay. And as soon as I stood up, it blew. Mm. Now God has healed me pretty well. But from here to here, all the way up, it burnt all, melt, not burnt, melted all of the skin off of my leg. And I remember your face. if my face had been there yeah, right. at the temperature that it water, because it was so hot I had pajamas on, and it shot three times. The first time it shot, I said to myself, did I just get burnt? You know, you know that, 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 that I was in shock. I said, mm -hmm. I, I know that thing didn't just, just didn't burn me. And the pain hadn't hit yet. Mm -hmm. Anybody know about that secondary pain when it comes? Mm -hmm. And then the second time it shot up, and I says, and I'm frozen and I can't move. And I'm thinking, boy, that water is hot. I don't think that was my exact words. Mm -hmm. And then the third time it hit, and I said, well, I got to turn this thing off, but I'm stuck in my place and I remember grabbing the globe and hitting the valve and knocking it over. And at that point I screamed and the people upstairs heard me and they came down and they looked through the window and they says, are you okay? I says, I don't think so. And I remember lifting up my pants leg and there was no skin. It was all stuck to my pajamas. Mm -hmm. And I was able to walk into my office and my neighbor says, I I have a key do you want me to come in he says you want me to call 911 i says please and i remember the ambulance and everybody in the police and it was i would never seen so many people in all my life come and they were saying well do you want us to carry up the steps they had this funny looking chair thing they was going to i says no i don't want you to drop me i'm going to walk he says you can't walk on that leg like that and i says oh no i'm going to walk and i remember making it to the top of the steps and i sat on the gurney and that's when I passed out. Mm. And when I was in the ambulance, I says, well, how did I get upstairs? They says, you walked, but you were driven on adrenaline. And I remember going to the Pittsburgh, and I went to Uniontown first, and then they sent me to Pittsburgh. And the doctor says, well, you can't go out. You can't do this. You can't do that. I says, but I got to go to the church. And he says, oh, you can't go to church. And I was a drummer at Mount Olive. Mm. And my wife was like, you can't go to church. And I says, let me tell you something. If God spared me from having my eyeball burn out and my brain melted, I'm going to church. Amen. I says, I'm going to be wrapped up. And I was in an incredible pain. But when I went through that door, God said, for these next three hours, I'm going to remove that pain. Because you see, I felt myself 
having to go and worship and say thank you because I was still here. Amen. See, a, lot of, a lot of folks ain't here right now. Oh, that's the truth. Amen. A lot of people can't say thank you because God ain't saved them, yes. but he saved me. Yes. And he brought me from a mighty long way yes, out of all the stuff that I was doing. He kept me. Yeah, he and he says, I got you for a reason. I got you for a testimony. I got you because you're going to serve where I need you to serve. You may not go to some big glamour. You go, I want you to go where I'm going to send you because that's where I need you. you. You see, there's a lot of places people can be. And they says, well, I've lost it all. But you see, God saved me. And I says, if there's any breath in my body that I can make it to church, I'm going. Amen. And through the pain, and I'm telling you, when you have a burn and you have to scrub it every day, you have not ever witnessed pain like that before. And I remember when they peeled off because it was all bubbled up and stuff, and they didn't do much at Uniontown. They just kind of dressed it and gave me, uh, what's that stuff, uh, Oxycontins. Yeah, they shot me up full of that. And, of course, I didn't have any pain. And then I get to Pittsburgh and... I remember the doctor saying, well, take one of these before you leave to go down because they're going to treat you down there. And I was like, oh, I don't need that stuff. And when they started peeling the skin, it was by the grace of God that I still made it. And when he peeled back all that skin, he says, this is what it is. But here's the miraculous thing. Is I want to get to this part of the story because I had to go every week. And as the days went by and the scrubbings would go on, and I remember I would grab the wall as I would turn on the water and scrub because you have to scrub with soap and water and you've never felt the burn. It, this was worse than the initial burn. And as the days went by and I kept praying, I says, God, I don't want to take this kind of medicine. I'd rather just take the ibuprofen and, and, and see what that does. And it was painful. But I remember one month to the day I got burnt that I went back and I remember the doctor saying, you don't have to come anymore, you've healed. And I says, really? He says, yeah. And I remember there was no pain. And he says, well, I'm really puzzled because I've never seen anybody heal like that. He says, what did you do? I says, I talked to the man upstairs, you see. A lot of folks don't understand about the man upstairs. Yeah. See, Job spoke to the man upstairs. When you're talking to the man upstairs, the man upstairs, can do all things. Amen. All things are possible through the grace of God. Amen. And so as I talked to the man upstairs, he said, well, who did you talk to? I said, the guy upstairs on the top level. He says, well, who? I run this place. I am the director of the burn unit. I want to know who you talked to. I want to know who saw you. I want to know what they did because I've never seen anybody heal so fast. I've never seen this. This is something that's blowing my mind. He says, who did you talk to? I said, I talked to God. Amen. And he stopped talking right then. He said, well, God has healed you. Amen. You need not come back anymore. Here's a few more dressings. Take care of my friend. Maybe I'll go to church. Mm -hmm. But you see, all yeah. things are possible. When Job sat in those ashes and his friends told him to curse God, mm -hmm. God says, just hold on. I got something for you. And even though the pain may have been unbearable, Job knew that his blessings came from God. And if he just held out, that if he just kept his faith, that if he just kept holding on, that he could have it all back again. But he wasn't looking for it back again. All he wanted to do was just thank God for Amen. being there for, that, for all the days of his life. Amen. You see, this is how God blesses us. This is how God uses us. Amen. This is what he says. Satan didn't know about God's people. And we as God's people are constantly being blessed. We as God's people are always being watched over. And you see, as long as we keep the faith, he's going to continue to watch over us. We have a relationship like Job had a relationship. Satan didn't understand that relationship that Job had with God. He didn't understand it. Otherwise, he would have tried to pick someone else. But you see, he says, oh, let me go for the rich guy. Not 
knowing that Job understood where his blessings came from. Yes, sir. We all know that God is real. All things, I say, all things can be done through God yes. and nothing is impossible. Touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor, all things can be done through God. Touch him again and say, neighbor, nothing can be done without him. Now touch him one more time and say, God is my protector and my shield and no weapon formed against me will prosper Amen. because God has our backs. God has us. We don't have to worry about a thing. All we have to do is trust, believe, obey, and continue to trust and walk how God wants us to walk. And even when we stumble and we fall down, as long as we're walking and we keep our hearts and our minds set on God, guess what? He's there for us. He knows that we are human. He knows that we're going to fall. He knows that we're not going to be perfect. But yeah. God is there with us every step of the day, every step of the way, watching over us, blessing us, yeah. and sometimes chastising us. Yeah. Yeah. And when we have to be chastised, don't get mad. <laughs> if he has to take something away from us, don't get mad. Because as Job says, he gave it to us. And he has the right to take it back. Amen. I'm so glad that God has been watching over me through all my foolishness, through the times that I know I should be dead. I'm so glad I'm able to share with you the things that has happened to me so that I can hopefully be an impact and an influence that somebody, whether they're here or on Facebook that watches these messages, will be touched and understand that God is there for us. Yeah. He's not picking and choosing and saying, I only want this person and that person and this family or that family or this color or that color or this race or this or that. He says, I want all of you. I have my blessings for everybody. My son, Jesus, lived, bled, and died on that cross for the whole world. That whoever believed in him can have everlasting life. And all you got to do is confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. And you too can have it. Yeah. It's not a hard thing to do. Yeah. You have to give up a lot, but you gain more. Amen. Amen. Trust him. I say trust him. The doors of the church are open today. If there's anyone out there without a church home who needs a refreshing, who don't know the Lord as their personal Savior, I invite you to come forth. But if all minds and hearts are clear, let us prepare to take our collection. and hearts are clear we thank you once again we thank you for coming out we thank Amen. you for sitting through the message uh, God is truly a blessing and he's yes. watching over us and as we go on the highways and the byways as we travel the lonesome roads God is always there with us yes. just always know that there's someone you can call on you can't call on your friends all the time you can't call on your families all the time you can't call on your neighbors but you can always call on God 
God is always going to be there oh. for you. He's going to always be ready to help you, to protect yes. you, to look over yes. and watch over you. And you may not get everything that you want, but I guarantee you, he'll make sure you have the things you need. Yes. Heavenly Father, as we begin to travel back to our abodes, we pray that we find them as we left them. Heavenly Father, touch and bless each and every member of this church. Heavenly Father, trust all the visitors. Touch all the people who have a desire to come out, Heavenly Father. I ask for your blessings on this world because there are so many things that are wrong, Heavenly Father, and so many people who don't trust or believe or even know you, Heavenly Father. And as you had patience, as you had love, grace, and mercy for us, I ask that you continue to extend it to those folks also, Heavenly Father. I pray that they understand and see the light before they close their eyes. In the name of Jesus, let this church say amen. 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 Yes. Thank you.